when was it confirmed in your heart that I want to be an imam? <laughs> Don't meet this sheikh in the dark alley, yeah, and try to take his topi off, yeah? There's going to be problems. If they can master their salah routine and have that punctual, then they've mastered the art of discipline against their own self, their own nafs and carnal desires too. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another edition of Cage Closed with me, Tariq, at, on the microphone. Check one, check two. Today, I've got a beautiful guest, someone I've been waiting to interview for the last couple of months. But before we even done the interview, we went on a tour together. We went to Palestine. We went to Jerusalem, and you know the saying, you don't get to know anyone unless you travel with them, work with them. Yeah. What's the other one, Sheikh? Deal. Dean. No, so you, when you deal with them. When you deal with them. So Business. We travelled together, and yeah, I just gave you a little hint who I've got here today. We've got Sheikh Osman. Asalaamu Alaikum, bruv. Good to see you today. Hope you got here um, all in one piece and all ready to go, <laughs> yeah, because it's going to be a nice afternoon talk. Alhamdulillah. Okay, uh, my first question for you is like, how you got to 2023? What has been your <laughs> journey? What's been your journey? And let's start from like a child, yeah, and let's quickly go through. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. That's a bit of, of a big question. Um, well, grew up in London. Okay. Um, Hackney. So my primary school years were there on Kaysnev Road. Secondary school was also on the same road. The masjid was also on the same road. Okay. So, yeah. You're just a, <laughs> you're just a Hackney guy through and through, aren't you, bro? MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. So uh, that was like... 15 years of my life and then went up north went up north for around seven years done my higher Islamic education there and then came well done a one-year tour of, uh, of UK of India Bangladesh and then um, 2014 I got back okay uh, got back say around at September yeah, September. And then in November 2014, I was in Slough. All right, so where did you study up north? Let's uh, Dewsbury. In Dewsbury, Marshall. In Dewsbury, yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah, I've been, I've been there a couple of times as well, just visiting. Yeah, small little town. Yeah, small little town, but some big things going on in there, mashallah. A lot of good work in the way of dawah and um, education. It's a, it, what is it? It's, can you just explain that about so, Dewsbury a little bit? Um, the institute actually caters for people from, well, we used to, from year seven onwards to GCSEs and then beyond GCSEs, they will take on a proper Islamic studies course, okay. uh, which is equivalent to a, ba uh, a, a bachelor's award in Islamic theology or Islamic sciences. Um, so I... I enrolled after my GCSEs, done my GCSEs in London, and then um, took up this course. So ideally, taking this course will give you the title of being, let's say, a student of knowledge or a scholar. Okay. Yeah. Commonly termed as a as a alim, in other cultures they probably say imam or maulana or uh, sheikh, whatever you want to whatever you want to call it. So um, seven years. In those seven years, you learn the uh, language, uh, Arabic language, yep. in terms of its grammar, uh, how it's not only spoken, but more, more, uh, more got to do with classical Arabic in how to uh, unlock the Quran and the Ahadith. So studying Arabic literature to a great depth. Then that goes on to uh, the jurisprudence, the fiqh aspects of things from a very basic level, then it develops uh, uh, to a very high level, um, which is equivalent to studying law. Okay. So how people will study law and become lawyers and barristers, the equivalent mm. of that is what we study uh, to become Islamic lawyers, to give rulings okay. and so forth. 
Then we go on to study tafsir and then the, the books, the six books of a hadith, uh, the six most commonly known books of a hadith. Okay. So the end, the last year is when we study the, the main books of Bukhari, Muslim and so forth. And then that's when you graduate. So when you were learning Arabic, you actually like, you never learned like, it's like uh, um, classical Arabic, Fusaha? Fusaha? Cla yeah, classical Fusaha Arabic, yes. Fusaha Arabic, yeah. nice, mashallah. That's good. So um, after that, after you left um, Dewsbury, mm -hmm. what happened after that? So when we left, um, well, when I left and graduated, we went on a tour, a da'wah tour. Hmm. Um, two months I spent in the UK. Then a uh, two, uh, two months I spent in India. And then uh, I spent f approximately four months in, yeah, four months in Bangladesh. And then came back to the UK and spent another four months here. Uh, the last four months is where you walk from town to town, rural areas looking for Muslims uh, who've just gone, got disconnected from the rest of the community. Okay. We try to bring them back into the community. Okay, so was that like working on the streets then? That was on the streets, in the nook and corners, everywhere. Alhamdulillah, yeah. alhamdulillah. So what were you, was that just like um, focused on like the Asian um, Not Not just Asians, all Muslims, so all Muslims, all Muslims. Just our, just our, all Muslims. Mashallah, that's very good. And so then this is targeting those on the streets and they're not going to come to the masjid. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. you can give all the talks to the masjid, but if they're not, if they're not getting there, mm. <laughs> then it's still a problem. It is a problem, So yeah. this, is, this was a mission of getting out there on the ground to those uh, to those people. So, in that time, yeah, when you were doing the studying and you finished your GCSEs, then you went to Jewsbury. Yeah. When did you know? When did when were you, when would, when was it confirmed in your heart that I want to be an Imam? Okay, what, good what question. Happened? There's there's a presumption that these people who go and study knowledge, knowledge mm. of Deen, they can't get any jobs, or what job are they going to do afterwards? And mm. that's why a lot of parents, I think, become reluctant also to send their children down that path. So naturally, these questions will occur. What are you going to do after you graduate? People do take different paths. People go into further studies. They'll go into uni or they'll go into further studies in terms of uh, Islamic sciences itself. Mm. Um, some people will go, in, go, go into the teaching field, get qualifications in teaching and go on to become a teacher. Some will go on to, do, um, to work as part of their work to do research. Mm. Uh, some will go into chaplaincy, that's either in prisons or in hospitals. Some will become imams um, and some will just um, will pick up a different path, keep their knowledge in Islamic sciences as something they, they, they do anyway, they practice and they teach, mm. but they also have a career side by side. So there, there were many options that you could pick from, but it was when I was on this one year tour, that's when it kind of sat in the bottom of my heart that I want to actually become an Imam. I did have an option of teaching in a well university or Islamic institute like mm. the one I graduated from. Okay. I had that offer on the table. Um, but then something which was more kind of closer to the heart, something which w I was more um, kind of enthusiastic in doing was to get in the midst of the community okay. and to be working along with the community. So. So it, it, you got pulled, you, it, your heart pulled, pulled you into it while yeah. you were on that journey yeah. for the year. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Um, so now, up to when you moved to Slough. So what, when did you move to Slough? November 2014. You like you knew that off the top <laughs> of your head. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And, and, and is that when um, you started at Masjid? That's when I started, Jannah? yeah. Okay. At Masjid Jannah. Okay. Um, so since then, I've been in Slough. So since 2014? 2014. Okay, so we're coming up to your decade <laughs> in Slough. Okay. Alhamdulillah. I hope you still get out to get back to Hackney from time to time. I do, I do. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Mashallah. Yeah, you need to um, sometimes get out of Slough. <laughs> Let me um, ask you a question. So your day-to-day -day working in the, in the community, in the masjid, yeah, how... How do you um, organise your day? How do you organise your day? See, we're trying to get into the life of an imam here. Yeah. Yeah. Not just, you know, the knowledge base and I think which we, alhamdulillah, all benefit from. But <coughs> we just want to know, like, 
how you organise <laughs> your day. Because I, the things you you brothers, mashallah, the imams do, I don't know how there's minutes, hours in the day to do it all. So give us a bit of an insight. Um, well, uh, get up in the morning. I have my, I have, uh, uh, my classes running, his classes running, 5.45 to around 7.45 in the morning. So um, depending on which, uh, you know, which season it is, if it's in the summer, then that will be after Fajr Salah anyway. So the day will start earlier mm. for the Imam getting there for Fajr Salah. Um, so that could be al uh, as early as 4 o'clock. And then 4 to 5.45 isn't much time, so he's probably just sticking the masjid until the class time. After class, um, if, it's this, if it's term time, school is on, then I would go to school as well after 7.45, around about 9, 9.30. I head off to one of the local schools, um, which I help out in. So I'm there pretty much until 11. Um, there's some other courses running, which I also um, am a part of and I teach. So by the time I get home after that, it's around 11.30, sometimes okay, 12. Inshallah. And then Dhuhr Salah. Yep. So by the time you, you get over Dhuhr Salah, now around Dhuhr Salah is one of those open hours where people will come for counselling. Mm. Uh, people will phone in um, for any advice and help. Uh, or they'll see me at the masjid. So give it around up to 2.45. I'm usually at, I'm in the masjid. Then come home, have a bit of some family time or personal time. Mm. Um, and then 4.30, 4.45, I'm back in the masjid okay. for classes. Uh, that, w that the classes run up to 7 o'clock for children and then again it depends on which season it is if it's winter then Isha is around the corner 7.30, 7.45 then we have adults classes after that otherwise if it's um, summer season then um, you've got a bit more time since the day's quite stretched out mm. but yeah in the evening time is usually when I have the adult classes um, and again people coming for their own counselling sessions okay. so day ends with Isha time that's a busy day. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so what motivates you to work hard? Then? What mo what's your motivation? <sighs> motivation. Uh, well, I tell you, the real motivation probably comes from our elders and uh, our, our teachers and our shiur whom we've seen, um, the way they've conducted their lives. Mm. It was clockwork. It, there, 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 was no other, there was no other mission. That was mm. the mission. So you have a mission, then it's going to keep you ticking the whole way. Mm. So it's what we have seen, what I have seen personally, people giving their entire lives 24-7 yeah. um, for the sake of the deen that we look up to. And of course, they, uh, will, they did make dua for us. They are making dua for us. And I'm, I'm, that's, that, that's the path that we are on, alhamdulillah. 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 Because... Um, you know, when you're doing good, it seems mm. like you get more done you yeah. know, as well. And, and there's it's more benefit in there. Alhamdulillah. If, Alhamdulillah. Allah Ta'ala will, blessed. of course, um, put barakah in the time. And you, without you realising, you'll get more done. So, what's, what's, we're going to go into a bit deeper into the podcast. But what's one of, your, one of the main challenges you, you have then in your everyday jobs? What's one? What's the one of the main challenges? What main challenges? Um, you're talking about the community, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what community problem? No, not. Co is is it time management? Okay, is okay. It like personal challenges. Two, yeah, personal okay, challenges. Okay, personal being challenges. in two places at right, the same, right, same yes. time. Uh, personal challenge is. Um, I don't know. <laughs> no. A personal challenge. It's to just keep going. To keep going. Yeah, yeah, just keep going. Yeah, well... Yeah, it's going to be hard, of course. There's nothing... Mm. Yeah, I'm not saying it's a walk in the park. Mm. Um, in, whenever you are doing the work of the Dean, you're going to get some challenges. Mm. And those challenges can come from any direction. Mm. And it just kind of... And sometimes it can, it can throw you off balance. Sometimes you can be questioning, okay, is it worth me carrying on? Or should I do something else? You just got to keep going. You just want to keep going. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've come into the gym sometimes in the afternoon <laughs> and I, I catch you punching the bags <laughs> and doing your 45 minutes like 
<laughs> Intense training, yeah? <laughs> Don't meet this shake in the dark alley, yeah? And try to take his topi off, yeah? There's going to be problems. So your training, yes. yeah? So just go through a little bit of your training. You, you, how many days a week do you train? Um, at least once a week. Um, and if at I least once a week, yeah, you'll hear more than once a week. <laughs> <laughs> at least, yeah. So um, I try to get that workout in uh, midweek, mm. usually around Wednesday or so, um, just to keep up with myself, really, because uh, I've experienced that if you keep fit, then you're keeping fit in all areas, mm. working for the dean as well. Um, and once you slacken in terms of your physical health, then that, of course, is going to have a knock-on effect in all, everything that you do. Mm. Um, it helps you de-stress as well. You do, mm. you do get a, a whole baggage of stress yeah. uh, being an imam. Yeah. Um, it could be just listening to pre people's problems. Um, that you just got to break out of the norm mm. and have a little workout and then you're fresh again to carry on. Alhamdulillah. Do you... Do you um Advise that to your, the people who come to the mosque as well about Oh, fitness. 100%. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Of course, it's part of being a Muslim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, 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 see a, we see, a, a, you know, lots of children and young men and girls coming here to do their martial arts and things. We don't really see much of the, the older guys. <laughs> Inshallah. I'm not part of the older guys. <laughs> <laughs> Inshallah, hopefully after this <laughs> podcast, you'll be coming along too. So, um, what makes you angry then? What makes me angry? Yeah. Ah, um, what, makes me <laughs> what makes me angry? Good question. Oh, disrespect. Disrespect. Yes, yes, oh, yes. Yeah. That is something would, that would possibly would trigger me, yeah. Mm, as a man, I think, as men, that, that's the, the thing we really like adhere to is yeah. respect yeah. And I mean religion disrespect. is about respect I mean mm. religion teaches respect respect for elders respect for each other respect even for the younger ones I mean mm. so yeah that is one thing that's a I think that's at the pinnacle yeah I think that's top for me as well respect disrespect another question I'd like to ask you it's um, a serious question in your in your profession in your job Feasibility, like you um, working inside the community. Can you touch on the f maybe just the three main issues what you come ag you come against on a daily basis? Okay, um, three main issues. One definitely marital issues. It's um, within a week. You're bound to get one case at the very least. Um, and sometimes there's ongoing issues that reoccur uh, or they need multiple counselling sessions or just advice throughout. But it's, it, it's a common one, marital issues. Marital issues. Yeah. What, what are you seeing in the marital issues? Because, you know, it's a known fact now. You know, there's, we're, we're witnessing a lot of people going through divorce mm -hmm. uh, or, the, or the breakup of families. Is, is, is that one of the main marital issues we're coming across? It is, it is, unfortunately. Um, look at, looking at it from a statistics point of view, um, there's more children being born outside of wedlock than inside a marriage. That tells you an, o an overall kind of um, what the climate is when it comes to marriage. Mm. And if we're living in that society, we're going to be affected by it. And everything that drives uh, to the break of a marriage, break up of marriages in other cultures or religions, that is going to kind of filter into the Muslim community. Mm. And I think largely we dismiss that element of it. You can say it's a, it's it's gone international now, actually, right? And that's because of the global push towards um, more of a liberal society. So people are not going by the framework which Islam has set for them. I'm talking about our own community. Mm. People are going by frameworks which are set by others. Now when you've grown up 
or when a generation grows up um, within a different frame of mind than that of a Muslim or an Islamic one, then their tolerances, preferences, and um, choices mm. are all going to be affected. Yeah. Uh, so people only remember Islam when it comes to the point of contract, contracting the marriage. Before that, some t uh, well, in a lot of cases, Islam is neglected. Mm. After the contract of marriage, again, is neglected. Mm. So the only Islamic thing which remains is the actual contract of marriage. There's, n there's, there's no upbringing, there's no nurturing of a person, whether it be someone young or someone who's come of age of, uh, of marrying, um, that they be geared and equipped with the necessary uh, knowledge, number one. Mm. Number two, practices and habits uh, that they need before going into the marriage. They have this Hollywood, Bollywood image of marriage mm. or something which they see on vlogs and, uh, uh, and social media and they think that every person's life is going to play out to that script. Mm. But when they get into the marriage and they see what reality is about, mm. what marriage is about, um, it's, it's a shock for them. They can't come to terms with it. They want to live in their fantasy. Yes, yeah, a real life issue, isn't it? Exactly. You're, le you're dealing with a human being. Mm. You're not dealing with, um, <laughs> with, with things which you can edit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't like it, edit it out. Edit you out. don't like a facial feature, change it. Nothing yeah. like that. You're, yeah. you're dealing with a human being. Yeah. Because it, it has a knock-on effect as well. When the, yeah. when the marriage breaks down, obviously... The, the families break down as well. The children have become have mental health issues. Hundred percent. There's a knock-on effect. Whatever the children see, um, their elders doing, mm. they're more like they're more likely to make the same choices and make the, the same decisions. Yeah. Or if they see a fa if they, if they see a, a marriage fail or a couple of marriages fail or marriages failing all around them, they're mm. they're going to think maybe. When they get older, why do I want to get married as well? So, there's a, there's a lot of things um, that contribute towards it, mm. but I think the biggest push is the liberal mindset. People view um, uh, marriage as an imprisonment, mm. which is a failure. Right? Yeah, from the start. From the start, mm. if you have that mindset as a man or as a woman, that's it. Uh, everything that you need to compromise in will be a matter of no compromise mm. and it will be a make or break because you have this thing that I'm free. I mean, you can't tell me what to do. Mm. You can't expect this from me. And that is what usually leads to some bitterness, uh, which, which again, just escalates into all sorts of things. Yeah. I think we're all affected, Muslims and non-Muslims. Mm. So if you, well, if, you, if you want to put it this way, the man hasn't remained a man and the woman hasn't remained a woman. Mm. That's what I was about to say. I think all the roles That's it. now have just been yeah. thrown up in the air, isn't it? So boundaries are all gone, right? The man doesn't know where his boundaries are and the woman doesn't know hers. Okay. It's, it's what we're dealing with. Well, another, another issue in the community... You see, with, with, with the youth, sometimes we can get, um, well, whatever, whatever, whatever's happening, alhamdulillah, but if you compare it to the population of the youth, then it's nothing, right? So we have youth activities going on. There was none. Mm. Uh, alhamdulillah, initiatives have been taken and we have, alhamdulillah, the youth activities flourishing. In you know you, you're looking at a hundred attendees hmm. um, on a regular, approximately you know like eighty to a hundred. Um, but if you look at the amount of youth that are in the community that are not attending, hmm. there's so much more. Hmm. So there is a disconnect between the youth and the masjid, or you can say the youth and the deen. Hmm. If you're you're eventually going to be disconnected from the deen. Okay. Right? So, um, no, matter no matter how many classes we have running, it will never be enough to cater for 
the Muslim population, the youth. If you look at the, just the children, the youth. Mm. So we got to see, okay, if this is how many are attending the masjid, how many are not attending? Where are they getting their Islamic knowledge from? Are they getting any Islamic knowledge? Mm. Um, you know, in whose care are they f for most of the day? Um, who's filling the gap in their nurturing, in their upbringing and their knowledge? If nothing is taking place, then you know that's a degeneration right there. Mm. So what you're saying is for every hundred children who are coming to get Islamic knowledge from mm -hmm. the masjid, mm -hmm. there's probably like three, four hundred that are not who are not. Yeah. And there's there isn't any other facilities to go out and maybe try to grab these kids and this is why y we're even if there are <coughs> they're on a very minimal basis, right? You have Saturday schools, you may have Sunday schools. But do you really think a few hours on a Saturday or Sunday is going to be enough to safeguard a child who's been bombarded left, right and centre, number one with atheism, number two with all the other garbage that's out there of mm. different ideologies, mm. different lifestyles. And then this child is attending a school, which probably is a, a secular school uh, with Muslims, non-Muslims, girls and boys. And they're going to be there for six hours. Mm. And then at the end of the week, they're going to have two hours or three hours of Islamic studies. Um, look at the balance. Do you see a lot of problems arising from the, this new um, LGBTQ phenomenon going on? Do you, do uh, so far, um, problems as, uh, as in people coming and <coughs> either admitting they have some inclinations, no, not so much. Um, but... Has there been a shift in terms of tolerance and in terms of uh, acceptance? Yes, there has been. Mm. So people are kind of becoming more accepting to it. Uh, well, that's what, all, what's, that's what the normalization agenda is all about. Yeah. Getting people to accept that this is fine. Um, that I can see happening more quicker, actually. Obviously, there's confidentiality, but have, have you personally haven't had to um you know give any kind of advice to someone who's come to you with these kind of issues around lgbtq I, ha I have had um but a lot of people will not come quite direct and say this is the inclinations i have but they will word it in an uh, in a in a scenario if you know what i mean or oh, someone else someone else or um they'll word it in a very general in a general way not to expose that they have such inclinations. But from, from the youth, the questions that they start asking you gives you an impression of what is becoming normal. Mm. So I've had questions like, how about if you... If, uh, now, a lot of this, I think, tends to come from the social media, right? It starts off as a joke. People start joking about being... Um, homosexual or having a certain inclination or you know having a certain fantasy mm. that joke then eventually becomes a reality so questions like is it okay to kiss your friend for a joke or how about if you kiss them accidentally or they have this thing whereby they walk they walk they, they, they almost as if they're gonna walk into each other or mm. they're gonna probably kiss and they'll move away yeah, it's just these sort of jokes which then evolve. It it, it kind of desensitizes the whole thing, mm. the whole um, haram element of it, for example, because yeah. they're joking around. Yeah. You see, now it's only a matter of time before that actual sin becomes quite trivial in their eyes. Then real inclinations will also likely to develop. Yeah. Right, and that carries on. That's how it is. People don't see the end of it. People think, you know, it's okay, just joke about it. I'll just joke and say I'm, I'm like this and I'm mm. like that. Mm. But that then escalates. That I see happening more common now. People, how they used to view someone uh, or view themselves um, was different. Now they're okay to jokingly say that I am such and such. You see? Mm. Before they would never even jokingly say something. Right? 
um, especially about their own sexuality, they would not say it. Right? Not, not, even, not even for a joke. Now they're okay saying it for a joke. For a joke, yeah. Is it? As, as time is going on, the liberalism is just That's getting it. wider and wider, isn't it? Mm. So, um, That's one. Then you'll find a lot of girls arguing and asking questions. But what's wrong with it? That's how they were born. That's the, you know, they're still good people. Now you know the moment they start this conversation, they're coming from a very emotional um, perspective. Mm. Um, now, when someone's emotionally charged and inclined towards something or towards accepting something, now they're going to be quite blind to certain hard facts that Islam has laid down. Mm. They, wanna, they, wa they, want to, they will always want to argue rationally why it's haram. Whereas when it comes to haram and halal, we don't have a rational argument. It's simple as this is what Allah Ta'ala determines as good and this is what Allah Ta'ala determines as bad. Whether you understand it, whether you don't understand it, whether you understand the implications or not. Mm. Right? As Muslims, we accept it. We accept it. You see? Course. Now that acceptance of what Allah has determined as good and bad, that is declining. Now people want to rationalize because they're emotionally charged. My friend, she's, you know, or he is such a good person. The character is so good. Everything's good about them. But this is the only problem. So what's the issue? Mm. You see? So, or they want to make it into like a, it's, it's their own personal, um, uh, personal issue, right? It's nothing which um, religion should dictate. And again, that is, the, that is the consequence of living in a secular society. So the secular society, the first thing they, that people bring out or we'll say was, who are you to judge? Yeah, yeah. religion is something yeah. which, is, um, which is your private matter. Mm. Don't bring it into the public. You do what you need to do, and that's it. Do you ever get stuck with, do you ever get, like, hit a brick wall? Are you, are you supported in, in your... Are, are you being supported in your um, we have um, in your answers to um, mm -hmm. to LGBTQ? Are you being supported by the community, by by powers above the imam? <laughs> yeah, in 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 um you know pushing back the narrative of the LGBTQ. Uh, from from within the uh, masjid framework, we have support. Uh, mm. From the public as well, there is, there, is, there is support. And then we have a network of scholars and imams as well. Mm. We have the discussions amongst ourselves on how to tackle it locally. So yeah, yeah, there is some sort of support. So we also we should try to you know, educate our children as well, not even to joke about these matters at hand, you know, because you hear children, they joke about calling, pe calling each other names and things like that. But on certain topics like this, for instance, they, they should be advised not even to joke about 100%, on it. Really. 100%. Hundred uh, percent. Because the the moment you start entertaining jokes in regards to it, then you lose the gravity of the sin, mm. and then it just becomes normal. Right? Mm. If you if you want something not to become normal, you gotta it's got to be out of the conversation. Mm. It can't be in your general convo. Mm. Because it is, it is one part of the shaitan's playing it mm. to acceptance is to have a bit of humour about it, first of all. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I understand. So, Sheikh, the third challenge is... Uh, please tell okay, us your third um, challenge. Third challenge... It's the community. It's a bit of like a continuation of the whole challenge... Um, of our children, our youth and everything. But in particular, I think, is our, our girls, our sisters, our young ones. Um, you know, as, as boys, we have a lot. We can just turn up, we can just turn up at the masjid um, and we have a lot to take from the masjid, whether it be Jumu'ahs or other um, uh, other talks going on mm. There's always something that we can do mm. Or even if it's outside of the masjid Somewhere like for example over here In Blackbeard we have a community hub Where mm. the boys can come together Right mm. under the identity Of being a Muslim and looking after One another and so forth 
We don't really have an equivalent for the girls. But the reality is whatever the boys are challenged with in society, from going to schools, studying side by side, sitting side by side with girls and boys, we often think, oh, this, we need to keep our boys on track. They don't get into this and that. They don't go off with girls and have girlfriends and so forth. Mm. I think there's a, the community has a lot of awareness that the boys can take these routes, including drugs and ev everything else. So we think we need to cater for the boys and uh, bring them into a right environment. Girls have similar challenges. If they're side by side with boys, they're going to have the same inclinations. And girls are more visibly Muslim than boys. Mm. Right? So that's an added challenge for them. Uh, if, so they have physical needs, they have emotional needs too. Now, sometimes society, parents, elder generation may overlook these things thinking, you know, it, it, you know it's just part and parcel of life. Get on with it. Mm. But really, you don't know what is going on inside that young girl. Right? She feels as though she's being in prison with this hijab. Now, there's no encouragement why she should wear it. There's no kind of education on what are the benefits of wearing it. Of course, the ultimate benefit is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the purpose of it. But what other things does it bring along? Um, so there's a lack of education why in Islam women are, um, or how, why they should carry themselves as Islam says. Right. There's a whole kind of culture of everything is haram for the women. Everything mm. is haram for the girls. Right. Mm. From makeup to lipsticks to uh, hairstyles and everything. Right. But in actual fact, if you were to study Islam properly, then no. In fact, everything is allowed and permissible, but the environment that you do things in will make it impermissible. Mm. Right. So to put makeup on, to apply perfume, everything. If you're doing it just because you're going out, you're going to be sitting next to boys. Of course, that's going to be <laughs> impermissible. But if you're alone, if you're at home with your group of friends, as in your uh, other sisters and around, then yeah, you can. But that kind of environment is not provided for them. Where can their girls go out as girls, as, gr as a group of friends and be safe? to be themselves, mm -hmm. to, they, girls like to put makeup on and show each other, or just for themselves as well, they, they like to dress up. It's in their femininity. It, it's, it's part of them. It's a part of their femininity. Exactly. So they need a place, an environment, where they can safely do that. There I isn't any place. I think, and I think um, women are more, Muslim women are more vulnerable to what's, to this agenda, what's going on out there at the moment, anyway? Then, then, boys, we've we've taken our eye off the provisions for our women and just concentrated for the, for exactly. on the boys because we know feminism. Mm. So, boys have physical needs, right? Yeah, boys have physical right? they needs. They need to yeah. they need to exert that energy. Girls mm. need to do the same, I believe. Yeah, they do. Right, but they don't have the space for it. They they can't go out into the parks and do it. Right? They haven't got or, the provision. Yeah, and also. They have been attacked by this feminism um, ideology now, which like and we as the Muslim community, I think, play into that narrative mm. <laughs> because we haven't done as uh, you know as much for them. Well, some some Muslim women have picked up the baton and ran with it, the the <laughs> the, 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 f the feminism part of it, uh, which we need to and like it's taken it to a different extreme. It's taken it to a different extreme. So yeah. yeah, I I agree. I agree as a father of, of daughters as well that. We have to like. We have to step up and step give up, them that safe atmosphere. We can't expect them to stay at home, no. right? That, that 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 was for a different setting, a different culture. Hmm. We have to understand we're living in the West, in the secular society, and they are going to be they they are going to want to do many things which other normal which other non-Muslim girls hmm. get up to. Hmm. We have to provide the alternative or a safe environment where they can uh, do things which are permissible. Alhamdulillah. 100% agree on that, brother. Yeah. Um, let's move on now to uh, another question which is like deep in my heart, which, which you know, 
walk it, walking around on this earth at the moment, it's just like apparent that it's like they're trying to close up the shop on religion. They're trying to stop um, spirituality. I mean, obviously what we're just talking about with that, the woke movement, mm -hmm. the LGBTQ <coughs> movement, but in, in every department of finance, every, every department you think of education, everything's closing the, do closing the doors. Yeah. <coughs> Where did this war on spirituality start? <laughs> Obviously, with the shaitan. <laughs> it's started with shaitan, yeah, just yeah, about to say, yeah. But um, um, bring us forward now. What, what's, what's actually let's, happening? Let's, let's fast forward um, from there. You know, you can look at it from two, two angles. One is, one is from scriptural evidences. We know the world is going to go towards that direction. If the world is going to have to come to an end and the jaw is going to have to come, there's going to be things which happen along the way which challenges religion as a whole, which challenges Islam, mm. right? Uh, we've been told that. But bringing, into, uh, bringing the conversation into our context of living in, say, UK, in the West, it would be, be good to have a look at Christianity as like a case study because, of course, they were the dominant religion or faith practiced in England, in the UK. Mm. And if we see what has happened to them and how it happened to them, then we may be able to understand what we shouldn't be doing. So to begin with, Christianity as a whole went through this kind of dilution. Is that a word? <laughs> right? Yeah. Being diluted, being becoming very soft to foreign practices and bring it in as a Christian practice, right? Mm. Just watering it down, right? To mm. be more accommodating. Accommodating, apologetic, yeah. yeah. And that, was the, was, uh, that resulted in losing the essence of Christianity, what they stood for. Then it came to a point where Catholics were too traditional and orthodox, Protestants were more liberal and kind of more... Um, uh, more what was it called, literal in terms of their uh, taking from the Bible. Orthodox had more of an interpretation. Now, of course, there was some uh, abuse of power within the church. And given the Industrial Revolution, science and everything which started mm. to boom, uh, people became um, more skeptical of everything. Now they had some generations of old practices against new theology and um, new discoveries. That also came with a push from, uh, which was a minority at that time. Now you're looking at 1900s, and then that develops until 1960s, um, of people who do not um, ascribe to any religion. So basically atheists. 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 So you have atheists, Yeah. you have secularism yeah. as well. So you say... Um, Let's start from Christianity. They had Christianity, yeah? Mm. Uh, that was the dominant religion and faith which everyone ascribed to. Then you have a small uh, group of uh, people who broke away from religion. And that small group of atheists became a lot more with the Industrial Revolution, with the advancement of technology and science. Now... Fast forward, it came to 1960s where they actually accepted secularism. And so before everything went by the church, okay. the church was the overall power. Mm. Then when they kind of, when society became more accepting of secularism, uh, which basically is forget scripture, forget what the textbook says, we're going to base it on our own logic and rationale. So if it makes sense, and there's evidence, scientific evidence for it, that's what we will go by. So the society became governed by logical reasonings. Mm. Now, logical reasonings, when you boil everything down to your own logical reason, then no two people's logical reasonings can be the same, let alone a whole community. And that's why, over time, even though this was a secular country, for decades, Right. Mm. 
they still didn't accept certain things which they become accepting of decades later. LGBTQ is one of them. Even as a secular society, it was still um, outlawed. They've only kind of gi given it legitimacy in the recent years. Right? Again, if logical reasoning and secularism and basing everything on the rationale was, was the best method, then they wouldn't have a need to kind of reform things as they go along. Okay. Right? Yeah. You see? The same people or the same kind of nation who accepted things became or, or didn't accept things became accepting of things. This has got to a point where if you look at the two thousand and eleven census, uh, atheism Went up to f around about thirty nine to forty percent of the of the population. Yes, yeah? and now in the recent twenty twenty one census, it's it's more than half the population don't ascribe to religion. So this is we're not living in a Christian country anymore. No. It's actually an atheist country. Mm. So if that is the environment our generation is growing up in then of course it's going to have an effect on our Muslim community too. If they're going to the same schools, which school everyone, you can't expect someone to grow up um, going through the schooling system and not have these um, secular uh, ideas and concepts which they conform more to than the Islamic tradition. Mm. Then they be they begin to look at Islam from the prism of secularism. They begin to measure the truthfulness of Islam based on these preconcepts, which are provided from the secular society. And they want to see if Islam is just or unjust, fair or unfair, good or bad, based on the wrong kind of criteria. Yeah, they think see? it's like the way of thinking is just completely it, it, changed. It, it's 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 not the Islamic way. It's like it's like learning a, like speaking a language. You know, like when you say, for instance, you speak English, you're thinking in English. Yes. But if you if you um, learnt Spanish, now <laughs> you're still gonna be thinking in English to how to speak Spanish. Yeah. So yeah. now this is what they're doing. This is what we're doing with um, the teachings of Islam being in that an Islamic society. You are actually thinking secularism when you look at Islam. Mm. Is that what you're trying to that, say? That's, that's, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. So when we, again, reflect on Christianity, the first thing they did was to break away the masses from the church. Once that happened, then atheism boomed. Mm. Right? They had no regard for their clergy and whatever it may be of their hierarchy and the church itself. They abandoned going to the church because they were disconnected from it. Mm. Then what happened was the churches became converted into many things, including masjids. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and that's where we, ha we have arrived in 2023, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. We're, that's with, where we are now. With most of the country as atheists. Now, if you want to talk about Muslims and Islam, where we, which direction we're heading in, then if we're not smart enough and if we don't wake up to what's happening, you never know, just as Christianity was the dominant religion and they've become, you know, pretty much um, atheists now, Muslims can end up the same and the masjids could end up the same mm. too. Given the fact, if you look at the masjids now, how empty they are, how much of the younger generation are attending the five times salah? Mm. You, can, you, you can only say if this is not rectified and reformed, mm. then down the line, 10 years, give it 20 years, or the next two generations down. If they don't see the elder generation go to the masjid, they're not going to go to the masjid themselves. And I think since the Second World War, since they split up the Middle East and had this, you know, first of all, this trickle, now this full-blown-out war over the last 25 years on Islam and Islamic countries and everything, I think that's because the only ideology islam where people would still follow because it, it has no it, it doesn't um like you say like you said earlier it doesn't apologize it doesn't um cater for if you you know it doesn't try to like 
accommodate outside liberal thinking. Islam is what it is. This is why this... this, um, this 100%. That's why we, uh, it's not easy to um, get rid of Islam as it was with Christianity. Christianity has uh, ha had too many flaws mm. within the Trinity and within their, their practices. They had too many flaws. So as a Christian who couldn't answer the questions, they just left it. When it comes to Muslims, it's harder because we have sound evidences, even logically, to prove Allah's existence and the truthfulness of, uh, uh, of the Qur'an and so forth. Yeah, we have a very rich tradition, um, or evidence, right, which the other religions do not have. But unfortunately, what you'll find is that the Muslims themselves are ignorant of the richness of Islam and the truthfulness of it. Thereby, without even studying it or looking into it, they would buy into these atheistic uh, ideologies. So, give me an ayah from Quran what now um, backs up what you just said in the last 30 seconds about Allah, how Allah doesn't need a people. He will just bring on um, a new set of people. That if you turn away, then Allah Ta'ala will bring another nation yeah. who will not be like you. And, that, and this is what was happening now, isn't it? Universally, mm. over, throughout the world, we are seeing like people coming into deen. Yes. By loads, yeah. loads of people coming into deen. Mm. And um, even, on, even on social media now, you're, you're hearing Islamic phrases which are non-Muslim and using like mashallah, inshallah <laughs> as well. So what have you noticed in, in the community in, in the way that Islam is growing on a positive side of things? What have you noticed? Um, there is um, a growing awareness, shall we say, of the need of protecting ourselves, our iman and our children, our generations to come. So at least that's a posit positive sign on its own. Do you have conversations with non-Muslims who are actually agreeing on that point as well? Where uh, we not, where now they're looking for moral protection and maybe Islam is a solution to that? Conversation with uh, non-Muslims but who adhere to a faith, they'll mm. share the same uh, sentiments as Muslims in mm. terms of the spread of irreligiousness, right? And the lack of morals. Um, atheists... I can't recall having a conversation with an atheist. Well, from, from a Dao perspective, yes. The only thing they had was they wanted to be free. <laughs> so mm. they chose atheism. That's yeah. it. They just wanted to just do whatever they want, not feel um, restricted in any way. Mm. Um, and that kind of mentality, I, I think, um, uh, has its impact on lifestyle and everything. I, I, I think it's, it's opposite to freedom. It, I think it's a they cage. Are, they are imprisoned, yeah. It's just a big cage. When they actually <laughs> go and touch, the, find the, the, the cage wall, they'll know. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You, all you, uh, you know, uh, we as Muslims, this is what we believe. Become the slave of Allah and you become liberated from being slave to anything and everything. And the moment you refuse to bow down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you're going to become imprisoned by everything and anyone, everyone. Mm. And everything. Everything else becomes your master. That's it. Women and music. And you can never please so many masters. Material, yeah. So you will never be happy. You will never be content. Mm. But the moment you submit to the one, where well, everything else becomes irrelevant. Your happiness will be based on how happy you are worshipping Allah. Your contentment is that you knowing that I have done what Allah has asked me to do. Everything else will come and go. That's peace, isn't it, brother? Yeah, that's In peace. It's true form. Yes. MashaAllah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, what are, what are some of the practical ways we can tell the youth and tell, you know, new Muslims how to protect themselves from these temptations and... How 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 can we um, you know get that get that initiated? How can we help them? How can we tell them that? Well, um, one is 
there are certain practices within Islam which helps you build that resilience. Resilience against your own nafs, what we call it. Your nafs. own carnal desires. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, if you look at salah, right, fasting as well, both of them help in building up your resilience, in disciplining oneself. Just look at salah, having to wake up early in the morning for fajr salah, whether it be winter or the early hours of summer. Right? That's discipline. Mm. That's going against what you want in terms of your comfort and your sleep. Right? Now, if you can just practice on the five times salah and have that discipline of performing those salahs, Right, that is you showing that you have a lot of self-control, you have restraint, you have resilience. Right, mm. that would definitely um, help a person when it comes to other challenges, other other things which are very desirous, whether it be one temptation or another. If they can master their salah routine and have that punctual, then they've mastered the art of discipline against their own self, their own nafs and carnal desires too. Look at fasting, fasting the same, right? That's in Ramadan. Outside of Ramadan, you can practice fasting Mondays and uh, Monday, uh, Mondays and Thursdays too. Mm. Again, if you're staying away from your basic necessities, that's building your resilience against those things which you're not supposed to be doing at all. Now, you can, you might as, let's, let's, let's go a bit further. How are you going to Motivate yourself to even do the five times salah or fasting or any other good action, right? Now, that's going to come down to what we call the suhbah. Suhbah is companionship. Those who were around the Prophet wasallam and they believed in him, they became the sahaba, the companions of the Prophet wasallam because they accompanied the Prophet wasallam. They stayed in his presence. They learned from him. Likewise, Whoever's or whichever company that you take, whatever is the climate environment of that company, mm. that's what you're going to be affected by. If you're going to be surrounded by people who do anything and everything, they follow all their desires and they have no limits and restraints and, um, and practices, uh, good practices. And you think that you in the midst of all of them you're going to control yourself and you're going to be practicing and good is not going to happen. So you, you need to surround yourself with good company, good people who are like-minded trying, and, uh, trying to achieve the same thing. So that would, inshallah, help uh, a person um, refrain from all of these temptations. What, what are your hopes for the community you're working in at the moment? You know our beautiful Slough, <laughs> and like other other communities, what 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 is your hope and your wishes to see, inshallah? My no. hope is to see Islam flourishing and the Muslims flourishing. Mashallah. So I think the Muslims will flourish once they begin to um, make Islam flourish. Islam will make them shine all the more. Muslims are everywhere; they're in every field. Men and women alike, but the only thing missing, I guess, is more of Islam in every field that they are in, whether they be in, they're in the hospitals as doctors and nurses, whether whether they are teachers and uh, whatever other profession uh, professions they are in. We want to see more Islam in the Muslims, so that the wider non-Muslim community can see what it means to be a Muslim. And what about people um, who are on that edge of wanting to become Muslim as well? What, what would you say to them? What, what advice would you give to them just to make that step as well? To make that step? Because time's running out. Yes. Time is running out really, isn't it? All the signs are coming, inshallah, very fast yeah. now. So. so someone who is you know, on the edge, okay, if they haven't read the Qur'an, read the Qur'an. The Qur'an will speak to you. Um, if you haven't visited the masjid, visit the masjid. And have a 
conversation with the learned and hopefully that should put away some uh, some doubts and questions but always remember shaitan's always there the devil's always there not wanting you to take that step whether you're a non-muslim looking into islam or whether you're a muslim and you're just thinking about when i need to make that turn mm. right mm. shaitan he has this um uh, he has this practice called taswif which comes in a hadith it says i'll do it i'll do it later all right just not now but i'll do it maybe tomorrow and that tomorrow continues and it doesn't come so taswif. that's taswif yeah he'll say yes soon i'll do it soon all right you can do it later later and that never ever materializes so sometimes you've got to just take the step and make the tough decision and then you'll see that shaitan has backed off yeah. <laughs> yeah it is yeah Inshallah. Inshallah. that's very good advice very good advice to uh end this um podcast on on that last bit of advice you know you can always come into blackbeard mma our gym here in slough and pick up a quran you can also go to all the masjids around, especially our one, our local one, where the Sheikh resides, Al Jannah Masjid, and pick up a Quran there. Go and ask any questions you like. There's always be someone who will be there to help. Um, I'm very honoured to have had this um, podcast with you, bruv. Hamza. Yeah, and you know, for me, <coughs> this time frame we're in at the moment as well all came to light a lot on our last journey to Palestine when we um when we went and saw some historical um places and that last day we were there and we saw that in the graveyard the, the the golden gate yeah and the story of how Saladin <laughs> bricked it up because yeah. the Dajjal wanted to come through yeah, that's right. And it just, I got really butterflies and everything at this when you told us that because mm -hmm. it really seems like we're in these times. So brothers and sisters and, and the audience listening, go and research, study, look on social media, the, the Islamic content and get awareness of Islam, get awareness of how we are. And Muslims, we need to like get back on track, myself included before anyone else I say this advice to. All right, big shout out to our sponsor this afternoon, Maths to English, an online tuition and Islamic homeschooling. Guess what? There's a free trial as well. So get online or call this number and get all your information, yeah? So once again, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to my guest and my main man, yeah? <laughs> Imam Isman and yeah, cage closed to next time.